Welcome everyone. Welcome to our Canadian Water Workshop hosted by the Canadian Youth Biodiversity Network. So before we start, today we will be using Poll EV to get feedback for the presentation. So if you can follow along on your phone or a separate browser and enter the link on top of my slide, that will be wonderful. And I believe my team will also be dropping the link into the chat. So where are you joining us from today? So once you open up the link on your phone, you can just click on the image on, the, on your phone. Oh, wow. So we have people joining us from North America, from South America, and all the way in Europe. Must be late for you all there, eh? Oh. All right, that's perfect. So before we begin, we would like to do a little land acknowledgement. So although we are running this workshop today virtually, we would like to acknowledge that we live and study on traditional indigenous land, that many of this land are known as different cities, towns, and provinces on our map. The indigenous people of Canada are an important part of our Canadian culture and history. When the European settlers arrived in Canada, they signed treaties with our indigenous communities, but the indigenous people did not surrender their land. Hence, they are unceded territories. You will find throughout our presentation today, indigenous voices are an important part of our decision-making process. After all, how can we achieve marine conservation without first recognizing and respecting the importance of our indigenous culture, knowledge, practices? And now I will pass on to Laura to give an introduction. Hello everyone. So the Canadian Youth Biodiversity Network first began in Montreal at one of the international meetings for the Convention on Biological Diversity. Canadian youth representatives met some of the amazing young people from the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. They encouraged them to start a Canadian chapter. So fast forward to today, the Canadian Youth Biodiversity Network. We focus on providing a platform for youth across Canada to stand on and raise awareness and our concerns for biodiversity at a provincial, national, and international level. We aim to be inclusive regardless of cultural identity, sexual orientation, economic, and educational background. Some of the work we do includes raising awareness through social media, providing educational webinars, and building a network across Canada. Overall, with our work, we hope we can create a meaningful impact on our communities where we live in harmony with nature now and for future generations. Thank you so much for coming to this workshop on ocean conservation. Uh, so the speakers is Lisa Chen, who is a project coordinator, a marine biologist and educator, the Banchi Kukaria, who is a fundraising coordinator for and sustainability manager at the Canadian Environmental Network, Joko Lu, who is a policy coordinator and a co-founder for Seven, and myself, who am a policy coordinator and I'm finishing my MA in geography. Next slide, please. So uh, please go to the poll where we are gonna ask you what, what is a word that comes to mind while talking about conservation. Thank you. Uh, we dropped the poll on the chat, thank you. Well, I see many interesting points that's coming up into our work cloud. Um, many of you agree that biodiversity is very important when we are talking about conservation. And some of you mentioned livelihood. That 
is something actually that we are going to talk about that we cannot achieve conservation or sustainability without addressing people's need and their livelihoods. All right, this is great. I think we'll move on. So what is a marine protected area? When talking about marine conservation, marine protected area comes to mind. In MPA, also known as the marine protected area, is defined as a clearly defined geographical space, recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values as defined by the IUCN. I want to highlight that according to this definition, NMPA does not only conserve nature, but it also conserves cultural services. Mm -hmm. Adaptive management is not is something that is not we for, that happens in a five year circle, where every five years the MP is review adjusted according to this graph. As mentioned before, it is not enough to simply establish a park, and therefore this adaptive management is needed to review the project areas management scheme to see whether it's effective or not. So in Canada, there are three different governing bodies that have the power to make MPAs. However, they all have different mandates for the protected areas. Areas established under the DF, the Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Oceans Act are for the conservation of marine species, habitats, and ecosystems, while Parks Canada creates protective areas for the benefit, education, Oh, sorry. So the I for the conservation of many species, habitat, ecosystem, where Parks Canada creates protect areas for the benefit, education, and enjoyment of the people of Canada, and environment and climate change Canada aims to conserve habitat for a variety of wildlife, including migratory birds and endangered species. Canada is committed to protect 25% of its marine waters by 2025 and 30% by 2030. This aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Goal for in Life, Better Water, and IT Target 11 from the Convention of Biological Diversity. So currently, up about 30.8% of Canada water is prote protected compared to a global protected area coverage of 7.73 percentage. So this shows that the Canada is doing a great effort in managing its waters. Mm -hmm. It's worth noting that this 30.8% protected areas are not created under the dissection of MPA. Due to the stakeholder consultation and adaptive management process, MPAs take a long time to establish in a a lot of resources to manage. Therefore, the Commission of Biology Diversity created the conservation designation known as Other Affected Area-Based Conservation Measures, or OECMS, which is a geographically defined area other than a protected area, which is governed and managed in ways that achieve positive and sustained long-term outcomes for the Institute Conservation of Biodiversity with associated ecosystem functions and services and where applicable cultural, spiritual, socioeconomic, and other locally relevant values. Mm -hmm. Now moving on to Canadian marine geography, Canada has the longest coastline of the world. As you can see on our slide, it is actually 3.7 times longer than the second longest coastline of Indonesia. Canada borders three ocean basins, which are the Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Pacific. Now, the emphasis here is on ocean basins and not oceans. 
because as you can see on this map, we actually only have one big global ocean. All the ocean basins are connected to each other. And if we mistakenly label ocean basins as oceans, we are undermining the urgency and the need for global marine conservation efforts. Now we can talk about marine protection and sustainability without talking about marine spatial planning or MSP. MSP is defined as a public process of analyzing and allocating the spatial and temporal distribution of human activities in marine areas to achieve ecological, economic, and social objectives that are usually specific through a political process. This means that environmental protection measures must balance with socioeconomic and cultural needs of humans in order to be sustainable because otherwise you will get a very little compliance to the protection measures and create paper parks. Finally, the political process emphasizes the importance of public consultation and having all stakeholders at the table to ensure that the resulting plan is acceptable to everyone. Compared to traditional sectoral management where right, individual sectors manage their own uses of the marine space, MSB is integrated between sectors and levels of government, adapted to changing circumstances and participatory by actively involving stakeholders. By incorporating these concepts, MSP seeks to minimize conflicts between marine users and between users in the environment. And it is this concept that needs to be carried forward when establishing MPAs. Moving on to the Atlantic coast of Canada, which includes four provinces, which are New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador. As I mentioned in my land acknowledgement, these provinces belong to the unceded territory of our indigenous community. The waters of this coast is highly protective as the warm Gulf, Gulf Stream from the south mixes with the cold Labrador current from the north, which brings a lot of nutrients for phytoplankton to grow and support our diverse number of marine habitats, which range from seagrass beds to large expanses of mudflats to kelp beds and cold water corals. Due to the productive Atlantic water, it also supports a large range of marine mammals, such as whales, dolphins, seals, and seabirds and other marine species. Our guest speakers will go into more depth on marine mammals and seabirds conservation. This productivity also makes it very difficult to identify ecologically and biologically significant areas to create protected areas as different habitats, life stages of species, and the uniqueness, importance, vulnerability, sensitivity, recovery way, and the activity of both the habitats and the species need to be considered. To, to further complicate things, there are a diverse number of stakeholders whose livelihood depend on the Atlantic water. First, the Atlantic is well known for its fisheries, especially the lobster and the snow crab fisheries. However, not only commercial fishers need to be at the consultation table, indigenous fishers are also of great importance. According to our treaties, indigenous fishers have the right to a moderate livelihood fishery. As we currently do not have a definition for moderate livelihood, this has created a contemporary conflict between fishers, government, local, and non-governmental organizations. Further, the Atlantic also houses a number of marine and land-based aquaculture facilities. Our productive water also drives the industry the tourism industry by welcoming tourists from around the world to come and well watch. And like many coastal areas, shipping, oil and gas explorations are ongoing. Finally, the Bay of Fundy area in the Atlantic region has the highest tides in the world, where there can be a, a tidal amplitude of as much as 16 meters between high and low tide which offers an opportunity to develop renewable energy such as tidal energy. Therefore, marine protection in the Atlantic region must balance the environmental protection with cultural, socio-economic, and environmental needs of all the stakeholders. Now I will pass on to Devanshu to tell us a little bit about the Arctic. Hi everyone, let's take a trip to the Arctic Ocean. 
Um, so Arctic um, archipelago uh, is in Northern Canada and it occupies an area of 1.4 million square kilometers. And it's formed by almost 36,563 small and large islands. And it is uh, present in the three territories of Canada, namely Nanawood uh, Northwest Territories and Yukon. Uh, throughout the winter, uh, the whole archipelago is covered with 1.5 to 2 meter thick ice, uh, except for the pollinias. Now, you may ask what pollinias are. So pollinias are areas that uh, freeze, basically they freeze late and thaw early. So they are like open water zones uh, when everything else is frozen. And uh, that's why in winter it attracts a lot of uh, marine mammals because marine mammals need to come to the surface to breathe. Uh, so if everything is frozen, they use the pollinias. And in spring, pollinias, um, so sunlight penetrates uh, into the oceans through these pollinias. So it gives rise to like planktons and uh, it increases the productivity of oceans. So um, seasonality affects uh, the productivity of Arctic Ocean. And um, the waters of this uh, region are very rich in mammal species, uh, but they're, um, they're quite poor in fish species. Uh, next slide, Lisa. Yeah. So um, the Inuit people inhabit the Arctic. They were the last ones to settle, come and settle in North America. And um, they occupied the harshest climates when everything else uh, in the south uh, of Arctic was occupied by other uh, indigenous people. Traditionally, uh, just because the weather is so harsh, it's so cold that it's not possible to cultivate and grow like fruits and vegetables and food. So they depend on Arctic wildlife for their basic subsistence. And even presently, they still harvest uh, whales, seals, polar bears uh, for their consumption and to, to support their, uh, their lives. Uh, they also invented kayaks, so traditionally they were made through seal skins, and uh, they also used dog sleds for transportation on land and sea ice, uh, because you cannot drive a car on the ice, mostly. Uh, next slide. Um, Arctic Ocean uh, also faces a lot of challenges. Uh, it's, warm, it's warming two times faster uh, than any other region of the Earth. Uh, because uh, ice reflects the heat, but uh, water absorbs the heat. So with melting ice, it, the water around uh, the Arctic Ocean absorbs way more heat and it warms two times faster. Arctic wildlife relies on the sea ice uh, to hunt and to survive in winter, um, like polar bears and walruses, they, they need like ice patches on water to hunt uh, and, and survive. Um, uh, there is ocean acidification also, just because uh, there's higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, the ocean absorbs that carbon dioxide and which uh, leads to increased acidity and it affects uh, the shelf formation process of the shellfishes like crabs, mollusks, etc. And it will lead to like a catastrophic decline of the marine productivity. Um, it, uh, so also permafrost is melting. Now you might ask what permafrost is. It's uh, soil, sand, rocks, and, uh, and ice together uh, frozen in the land. Uh, it also has like plant debris and stuff like that. So when uh, the permafrost melts, all these plant debris starts decomposing and releases a lot of carbon dioxide. And to add to the issues, there's oil and gas exploration because of, um, because of um, the melting ice and uh, it leads to oil spills. Uh, there is shipping, which uh, leads to collision with mammals and uh, other issues in the Arctic. Now, my colleague Laura will talk about the Pacific coast. Thanks. Thank you, Devanchi. So the Pacific coast um, is all within the province of British Columbia. The coastal landscape ranges from low-lying deltas to mountainous fjords. The coast is really an integral part of BC's economy, as many of the province's industry depend on the ocean. This include tourism, transportation, technology, and seafood. So, 
Our Pacific Ocean supports a rich marine life. A species range from the very old, like now 9,000 year old glasses sponge trips to very large, like the blue whales, which is the largest animal. Other whales that live in this water includes the humpback and killer whale. This area is also home to a large range of marine birds. And as for fish, the Pacific herring is the foundation for, mo for, mo for most of the coastal food cycle. And there's the salmon based ecosystem that stretches from the watersheds inland to the deep Pacific. Uh, yeah. So the coast, uh, our Pacific coast is home to many First Nations. For thousands of years, these coastal First Nations have sophisticated fishing and sea mammal hunting technology. Uh, with river run salmon, it is a very important resource and, and a spiritual symbol. However, Pacific salmon is facing multiple threats. This includes habitat destruction, pollution, and unsustainable fishing practices. These threats increase with climate change as salmon is very sensitive to high temperatures. So even a small increase in the warmth of the oceans and river can harm or kill them. When salmon populations are in danger, other members of the ecosystems are also threatened. For example, orca populations in the Salish Sea are decreasing the numbers. However, there is hope. Uh, many coastal First Nations have signed a fisheries resource reconciliation agreement with the government of Canada. This agreement is facilitating an enhanced role in collab collaborative governance and in fisheries management and decision making processes for these coastal First Nations whose territory make up of 40% of BC's coastal waters. Thank you. Next one. Uh, we wonder if you have any questions. You can drop them on the chat or just uh, let us know. Thank you. Yeah, while you are submitting questions, I saw there was a question on Kuwa asking us what are some ways to include indigenous youth and other marginalized groups in water advocacy. Um, this is actually an issue that's ongoing in Canada. All, there is an increase in recognition of indig indigenous ways of knowing and incorporating 2i seeing into our government system. So 2i seeing includes that you are taking the goods and the strengths of the Western knowledge system and the benefits of the indigenous knowledge system and combining them into a unique way to solve our environmental challenges. And I believe that is the way forward. Um, for other countries as well, as well as Canada to work on to continue doing ocean conservation using 2YCN. Any other questions? If you have other questions later, you can drop them into the chat and we'll adjust them towards the end. Um, so now perhaps we'll move on to our guest speakers. So first up, I would like to introduce Dr. Hilary Morris Murphy. She works at the Bedford Institution of Oceanography, which is part of the Ocean and Ecosystem Science Division at the Maritime Region of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. She works with whales, and I believe she will talk about fisheries and oceans Canada's role in management. So, Hillary, Dr. Hillary, you have the floor. Uh, Dr. Hillary, you are muted right now. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, I am going to uh, shut off my video while I give my talk just to reduce um, 
any bandwidth issues I might have because I have a couple of videos that I, I do want to show. Um, so I'm going to turn off my video here and get my PowerPoint up and running. Okay, let's see here. Share screen. And I got to make sure I share my sound. So, do you see my PowerPoint here? Yes. Excellent. Well, um, hello, everyone, and thank you to the organizers so much for having me speak at this event. Um, as mentioned, my name is Hillary Moores Murphy, and I am a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada in the Maritimes region off the east coast of Canada, so around that Atlantic region um, that we saw. And I am excited to talk to you today about some of the whale research, monitoring, and conservation. Me and my team are involved with um, within fisheries and oceans. But before I jump into things. Um, just a couple of quick facts about me. So I did my Bachelor of Science and then my Master's of Science degree focused on uh, seal acoustics at the University of New Brunswick in St. John, New Brunswick. And then I did a PhD focused on cetacean or whale acoustics at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I now work at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, which is found in the Halifax area. Um, and this is Canada's largest ocean research institute. So it's a pretty cool place to work. Now, some of you may not know, but there are many different species of cetaceans and cetaceans is really just a fancy word, meaning whales, dolphins and porpoises that occur in our Canadian waters. And here off the East Coast, we have more than 15 different commonly occurring species. These include seasonal migratory species, such as the North Atlantic right whales, as well as year-round resident species like northern bottlenose whales. These also include several at-risk species or populations. In other words, endangered or threatened species or species of special concern as recognized on Schedule 1 of our Canadian Species at Risk Act. And in many cases, these species are also recognized as at risk internationally, such as on the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Fisheries and Oceans Canada is responsible for the management and protection of whales in Canadian waters, including these species here on the East Coast listed under our Species at Risk Act. There are many different threats to whales, and these are not unique to Canada. Climate change, entanglement, ship strikes, contaminants, pollution, underwater noise, and much more. These are important threats that can negatively impact whales in our Canadian waters as well as internationally. In Canada, we have many different tools that can be used to help protect whales. This includes formal legislation that prohibits the killing, injuring, harming, harassing, disturbing, capturing or taking the whales or destruction of their habitat, like our Fisheries Act, our Species at Risk Act, and our Oceans Act. Designation of critical habitat for species at risk and establishment of marine protected areas and other similar conservation areas also help protect whales in Canada. We have static or fixed as well as dynamic or more flexible management measures in place for protection of whales and in addition to mandatory measures, we have voluntary measures, best practices, and a number of guidelines out there aimed at decreasing the risk of human activities on whales. And we also have a number of research programs underway to help address threats to whales, such as work being conducted as part of our Oceans Protection Plan. And that's some of the work that um, my team and I are doing as well.
So this is where my work fits in. Research and monitoring activities can be used to help inform actions to reduce threats to whales. And there are so many different whale-related research activities being conducted in Canada by many, many different organizations, including fisheries and oceans. So the rest of this talk, I'll highlight just some of the research and monitoring activities that fisheries and oceans, and in particular, my team is involved with off of Eastern Canada, that's, that are being conducted to help support the protection of whales in our waters. So information on when and where whales occur throughout the year is important for understanding their distribution and habitat use. It's also important for assessing potential threats to populations and developing effective management strategies and mitigation measures to protect individuals and populations. Aerial surveys are an important source of information on whale occurrence off Eastern Canada. Sightings of whales have been collected by trained marine mammal observers that have worked from a number of different aerial platforms, including those run by Fisheries and Oceans and Transport Canada, and even the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has assisted with whale survey work in our waters. Some of these planes are equipped with special bubble windows, which observers can sit in to allow for easier spotting and identification of whales from the plane. And I have a picture of that in the middle of my slide here. Because planes are fast, aerial surveys provide information on occurrence over broad spatial ranges. And these surveys are particularly important for real-time detection and monitoring of the highly endangered North Atlantic right whale of Eastern Canada. So over the past few years, whale aerial survey efforts have been increasing substantially off the coast of Eastern Canada, with well over a thousand hours flown by these various platforms in 2020 alone. And this map shows the aerial survey coverage, and you can see the flight paths of the planes um, as these brown lines, and the associated sightings of right whales, which are all the gray circles you see on this map, for 2020 in both Eastern Canada and the Northeastern USA. So many of these right whale sightings in Canada resulted in fisheries closures and or vessel slowdowns to help protect right whales from entanglements in fishing gear and vessel strikes. Similarly, Vessel-based surveys conducted by trained marine mammal observers also provide information on whale occurrence, though it takes a lot longer to cover ground in a boat. And this map is an example of some of the vessel-based work conducted in Atlantic Canada in 2020, with vessel tracks shown as the gray lines uh, that you see on the map. And these are just the vessel tracks when marine mammal observers were looking for whales. And the gray circles are right whale sightings. So some of these sightings also resulted in management actions to protect right whales. While vessel-based monitoring methods provide lots of information on whale occurrence, aerial and vessel-based surveys are limited to good weather conditions and sea states. So as you can imagine, it can become quite challenging to collect data on whale presence during certain times of the year when you're out on a boat or up in a plane, and particularly during winter months off eastern Canada. So passive acoustic monitoring or listening for whales offers another way to collect information on whale occurrence throughout the year. So whales use sound for just about everything they do, and most species are highly vocal. In many cases, we can actually identify whale calls to the species level. For example, I'm going to play for you now a stereotypical right whale call that's called an up call. And it's called an up call because it goes up in frequency. So it sounds a little bit like a whoop. And just out of curiosity, was anyone able to actually hear that sound clip? Yep, that was great. Yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Now calls produced by other species, so I just played a right whale call, uh, calls produced by other species 
like these blue whale calls sound quite different than the right whale calls. Um, so this one you have to listen to very carefully because it's a very low frequency call. So I'm not sure if you can hear the big rumbly sound, so it just happened. And it happened again. So uh, sometimes the computers, these calls are so low in frequencies, um, some computers don't play them well. Um, but it's a very low frequency call that sounds a lot different than the right well up call. And then again, um, those blue whale calls and the right whale up calls, they sound um, completely different than the clicks and whistles of these common dolphins here. So I'm playing these examples just to demonstrate uh, that we can tell species apart just by listening for the sounds that they make and that different species in our waters sound quite different from one another. And in most cases, we can identify to species based on the sounds alone. So bottom mounted acoustic recorders provide data on whale currents by collecting acoustic data as recordings that can then be analyzed for the presence of whale calls. So this is an example of one of the PAM moorings or passive acoustic monitoring moorings that we use in my team. And these systems like many PAM moorings are designed to sit on the bottom of the ocean where they record for months to a year or more at a time and then they must be retrieved and data is downloaded and analyzed. So this type of particular PAM system, we call it an archival recording system because it just collects and archives the data and stores the data and you have to bring it back to shore and then download it and analyze it. So this map shows where different types of these bottom moored PAM systems were deployed off Eastern Canada by fisheries and oceans in 2020. This data, though not in real time, can still provide valuable information on when and where whales are using an area throughout the year and over long time scales. Some PAM systems, however, are designed to collect information on the presence of whale calls and relay these acoustic detections to shore in near real time within hours of a detection. So these kind of systems are being deployed on stationary or fixed platforms, such as some of the oceanographic Viking buoys in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, as well as mobile platforms, such as underwater Slocum gliders off of Eastern Canada to provide real-time detection of right whale up calls. So this map shows real-time acoustic detections of right whales off Eastern Canada for 2020. And these acoustic detections also resulted in management actions, including fisheries closures and vessel slowdowns. So these are just some of the research and monitoring efforts underway but many different by many different organizations off Eastern Canada. However, we still have so much to learn about these majestical creatures in our waters. So, to end things off today, um, I just wanted to point out that, of course, there are lots of different resources online for you to learn more about whale conservation efforts in Canada. But I wanted to point out two helpful resources if you're interested in learning more about identifying or monitoring whales of Eastern Canada. So there is an app available for both Android and Apple products called Whale Alert that provides information on how to visually identify different whale species. And it also allows you to actually report and submit sightings of whales and associated pictures. So if you're using this app in Canadian waters and you submit a sighting, eventually that report will and come to me and my team where we can take a look at it and store the data that is collected. And to see the latest right whale sightings, you can check out Whale Map, which is an interactive map hosted by Dalhousie University that's available online. And this map shows the most recent right whale sightings of Eastern Canada in the US, as well as 
past sightings that have been archived. Um, so this picture I'm showing you here, I just grabbed it yesterday and it's showing all the right whale sightings um, over the last couple of weeks. And you can see that there's lots of right whale sightings off northeastern US. We, we haven't had any in Canada yet um, this year, but uh, people are out looking and if, soon enough our planes will start to fly um, and be monitoring for right whales um, off of eastern Canada again. So with that, I would just like to say thank you again for listening to me and I would ha be happy to answer any questions during our Q&A session. Wow, that was amazing, Dr. Hillary. I did not know that all the cetaceans produce sounds that are so different from each other and that we can identify the species just by listening to noise in the water. Um, I do see a question in the chat, but I think we will do the Q&A together with all three guest speakers. So please hold on to your questions and keep typing them away into the chat. So I will just quickly introduce our second speaker, who is uh, Dr. Carl Alley, who is our Marine Protected Area Coordinator with experience and expertise with using seabird information in conservation planning. Dr. Carl, you have the floor. All right, let's get things going here. My computer might be a little bit of, a little bit slow in getting the getting into present. Can you see um, the slide now? Not yet. Okay, it should be coming soon then. Let's try again. I don't know what time. For some reason it didn't want to share it, but I'll try it again. Yeah, we see your screen now. Terrific. That's good news. <laughs> Do you see that now? Is that okay? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, first, Thank you to the Canadian Youth Biodiversity Network, uh, Lisa and organizers for reaching out to my colleague, Karina and myself. We're very happy to, uh, to have the opportunity to present to this, this group. Um, and we're really excited about, um, you know, already what, what I've heard and, and your synopses for the different ocean basins. Um, and I'm also excited to share with you some of what we're doing uh, within our own department, Environment and Climate Change Canada and the Canadian Wildlife Service. So yes, my name is Corel Allard and I'm a Marine Protected Area Practitioner. I work with the Canadian Wildlife Service. I'm based um, in Sackville, New Brunswick. I'm, I'm situated at the head of the Bay of Fundy and just out of reach of those 15 and a half meter tides, um, safe for now. Uh, my my co-presenter, Karina Jerdrum, couldn't uh, join us this afternoon, but she's a wildlife biologist that focuses on seabird um, conservation. She's based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and faces the open um, uh, Western North Atlantic Ocean. And for over 10 years now, we have and others have been working together uh, to advance the protection of important marine areas for migratory birds, specifically in Atlantic Canada. But what I will share with you um, is broader than what we've been working on personally and involves some of the efforts of colleagues within our department and, and others um, elsewhere in Canada as well. The Canadian Wildlife Service um, is a branch of Environment and Climate Change Canada, one of several branches. Um, if you think of the meteorology branch. It's another component of ECCC. But our specific Canadian Wildlife Service mandate relates, as Lisa uh, indicated earlier on, to migratory birds, species at risk, and habitat protection. And that spans a large number of species, but is not exclusive to birds. But from the perspective of marine birds or seabirds, because that's what you want to hear about, <laughs> Canada has a global, global responsibility. In fact, Canada hosts um, greater than 50% of multiple global populations of marine seabird species. 
Marine seabirds have or perform important ecological roles as marine predators. They're also valuable ecosystem indicators. They can tell us about prey type, prey availability, habitat quality, and they can also tell us things about species with which they co-occur, especially when we don't have a lot of information on those other species. Some clear examples of some of these, um, some of the species that we, that we work to conserve are uh, species like eiders that have a very strong connection to blue mussels that we find off our coast and in uh, Northern Canada as well. There are also uh, tern species that have close association with forage fish species like sand lance, or in this case, herring. And smaller bird species, phalaropes, which are a type of shorebird that are predominantly pelagic in nature when they're not nesting. One of the peculiarities of birds is their eggs don't float. So they can't be at sea all the time, but for many of these species, they're at sea most of the time. While they're at sea, marine birds, seabirds, face multiple anthropogenic pressures. Um, for example, chronic illegal spills of oil and fuel um, that are largely being mitigated increasingly so, but there's also the risk of catastrophic spills from shipwrecks. In terms of energy production, there's also a risk of catastrophic blowouts at rigs and also uh, conflicts with biological resource use. Uh, for example, competition for forage fish stocks, destruction and degradation of prey habitat, and certainly seabird bycatch. In addition to that, we see emerging pressures. We've, we're hearing lots about climate change and severe weather. Um, these uh, related pressures um, can act, um, can uh, be expressed unfavorably on, on seabird populations leading to the disappearance in some instances of nesting habitat for um, many bird species, or changing prey availability, type, timing, or depth, um, all factors that influence whether or not a, a bird is able to find the prey it needs when it needs it. There also uh, is the problem of invasive species. One example is the European green crab and, um, and other uh, diseases and, and genes that, that may not be um, native to our areas and with uh, consequent negative impacts on the habitats on which many bird species rely. Of course, there's uh, pollution in the form of excess heat, noise, and light that are emerging as, as pressures for species as varied as leeches, storm petrel at sea that um, are, are attracted to light sources and also species like the Atlantic puffin, and when they're uh, recently fledged, can be attracted by land-based light sources and, uh, to, and draw them away from where they, where they should be headed, which is at sea to find um, resources uh, for, for, uh, for themselves. And of course, there's also the matter of plastics and ghost nets. So in terms of birds at sea, and in terms of addressing threats, where do we start? Um, well, similar to um, marine mammals, as Hillary just presented, uh, we can fo focus on aggregations. In terms of aggregations, well, what types of, how, where do birds aggregate? Um, well, they aggregate for the most part around colonies where they lay their eggs and rear their young, but they rely while they're nesting on resources in the adjacent marine waters. We refer to these as colony seaward extensions. These are the, the adjacent marine areas within which birds have to find the prey they need to sustain their own um, energetic needs and those of their uh, uh, developing young. There also are staging and molting areas where feathers are changed. And in some cases, marine birds become flightless um, or lose some ability of flight. Uh, there are certain important migration corridors and, of course, wintering areas. Um, what's interesting is Canada not only hosts a large number of breeding bird species, but it also hurt, uh, hosts important and significant numbers of species that are here during the austral winter. These are trans-equatorial migrants, like the shearwater that's in the above left photo, and, um, and, and other species that come all the way to the Northern Hemisphere to find the plentiful resources of the Western North Atlantic. 
So how do we find these aggregations uh, when they're not in the form of colonies, which for the most part, we know where they are? Well, we use a combination of approaches, including land-based surveys, vessel-based surveys, uh, very, very similar to the vessel-based surveys that are used to detect marine mammals at sea, as well as aerial surveys, also analogous to approaches uh, used for marine mammals at sea. And also we are, we, we are increasingly using telemetry approaches such as GLS and GPS, um, satellite tracking to follow individuals from colonies as they uh, forage in these seaward extensions, but also as they move out of our region uh, for the winter. We can also uh, use habitat associations and various modeling approaches to help us define and delineate where these important areas are. Once we've identified them, we can celebrate them and we can uh, share their uh, knowledge of their importance broadly through various designations. Um, you may be familiar with important bird areas or key biodiversity areas. Um, there are also Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of, of International Importance. Um, there, there are Western Hemispheric Shorebird Reserve Network sites that are global in scope, or certainly at least Western Hemispheric in scope. And here in our region, ecologically and biologically significant areas in the bottom uh, right-hand corner is, uh, is a representation of the Eastern Avalon, EBSA off the Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland, which hosts globally significant uh, concentrations or aggregations of seabirds. So once we've identified these uh, important areas, well, what do we do about it? Well, we have to address pressures. And to address pressures, we have to use multiple strategies. There is no single winning strategy. We need the full complement of strategies, uh, tools within our toolbox to mitigate uh, pressures. These include species-based strategies, um, for example, those that may be specific to species at risk. There can be threat or sector-based strategies. For example, improving marine practices at broad scales at, a, at the sector level, for example, uh, fisheries waste management. And there can be place-based strategies. And this is where we can work to develop effective, spatially efficient and resilient protected areas. So in terms of protecting aggregations, well, we can use our own enabling legislation. We have two key pieces, the Migratory Bird Convention Act and the Canada Wildlife Act um, that are used to designate protected areas, legally protected areas. But we can also work and through engagement and towards the support of efforts of other authorities. And that includes uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada with uh, their own tools the Oceans Act or the Fisheries Act, we can work with our colleagues at Parks Canada toward designation of um, uh, national marine conservation areas. We can work with indigenous partners uh, throughout our landscape on the identification and designation of indigenous protected and conserved areas. And importantly, we have to work in certain jurisdictions with our provincial government counterparts to ensure adequate protections in coastal areas. Um, and a clear example of that is intertidal areas in the Maritimes and BC as well. Um, in terms of examples, here are some of our Environment Canada protected areas. We have 148 of them on the Canadian landscape. Um, 84 of them are terrestrial only. That doesn't mean, well, there, there's a subset of those that are coastal, but they, so they're adjacent to marine habitats, but do not include them. But a large number of them are both marine and, and terrestrial. They transcend marine and terrestrial realms as birds do. 57 of them. And we have a few that are exclusively marine. And one example there is the Terranova Migratory Bird Sanctuary um, just off Terranova National Park in eastern Newfoundland. Here's an example of a migratory bird sanctuary in Canada's eastern Arctic. It's where I did my own PhD research at East Bay um, on a tiny little island, Mitivik, um, that hosts one of the larger colonies of sedentaria, the sedentaria race of the common eider, which is pictured there, sitting next to it is a male king eider. I had to throw that picture in because they're just stunning birds. Um, but the migratory bird sanctuary does not only protect birds, it also protects other wildlife, um, especially as it's co-managed with Inuit uh, 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 governance. So it, that would include species like beluga and certainly the polar bear. 
that um, we had to share uh, our island with on more than one occasion. There is also uh, the National Wildlife Area under the Canada Wildlife Act this time, as opposed to the Migratory Bird Sanctuary and Migratory Bird Convention Act. National wildlife areas are generally highly restrictive protected areas. Commercial act activities are prohibited within them. This one is also co-managed, co Ninganik. But what, what's really interesting about this example, it's one of our largest areas that includes marine habitat. And its flagship species is, surprise, surprise, the bowhead whale. And the last example I'd like to share with you are our marine national wildlife areas. These are not as restrictive as our uh, national wildlife areas. Uh, like Ninginganik, um, they are designated under another provision of the Canada Wildlife Act, and they look a lot like an Oceans Act marine protected areas. They're constructed in the same way. This one is exclusively marine and designed specifically to protect the foraging habitat of seabirds nesting at Triangle Island and within the Scott Islands archipelago. The islands themselves are not part of our protected area. They're a British Columbia protected area designation. So we're, we've effectively built a mosaic of sorts of protections to comprehensively protect the species that we all care about. And this includes um, more than, greater than 50% of the global populations of Cass and Zocklet, the small gray seabird in the photo, as well as over 80% of the Canadian population of, of tufted puffin. So as you've seen, uh, in this talk, but also with Hillary's talk, we're, we're increasingly seeing an evolving landscape of protection. Here, I'd like to highlight an example from Canada's north, where we see multiple designations, including our own National Wildlife Area, Ninginganik, off the western Baffin shoreline right here, if you can see my cursor. There's also um, um, a migratory bird sanctuary at Violet Island. And um, there is a designation in Lancaster Sound that encompasses uh, the Coburg Island, uh, a national wildlife area, Violet Island, as well as Prince Leopold Island protected areas. So it again illustrates this concept of a mosaic of, protect, uh, of protection that can be implemented to more comprehensively ensure the long-term viability of these ecosystems and not only the species, but the people that depend on them. So there is opportunity. Um, conservation measures within networks of protection, they can be additive, they can be complementary, and they above all can be integrated. Um, I haven't really dis described that a little bit, but maybe I'll be able to touch on it a bit later. Networks can, can, can and should ultimately constitute whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. And multi-jurisdictional conservation mosaics can work. The Scott Islands exemplifies that concept. There are others closer to home here in the Maritimes, such as the Musquash um, Marine Protected Area. Um, these mosaics can enable, more, uh, can enable more appropriately scaled protections. We're actually protecting at the scale of the processes or the distribution of the species the distribution of the aggregations. They can transcend terrestrial and marine realms as well as jurisdictional um, and, and regulatory gaps. Multi-jurisdictional integrated management monitoring um, can be implemented effectively. And all of that um, can be enabled through harmonized language, metrics, and frameworks. And that comes through conversations that are had together across federal departments, also involving indigenous groups and our provincial counterparts. ENGOs, the public, folks like yourselves, academia, et cetera. So in summary, um, of course, marine birds are important comp components of marine biodiversity. They shouldn't be included because their eggs don't float. They shouldn't be excluded because their eggs don't float. And of course they have this, they perform these important ecosystem functions as marine predators. They are important indicators. And above all, ECCC or Canadian Wildlife Service shares responsibility for marine concert, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem protection. And we can contribute to addressing key threats in important areas in ways that transcend terrestrial and marine realms. And, and just a reminder and of, for all that migratory bird sanctuaries, national wildlife areas and marine national wildlife areas are important tools in our complementary toolkit that is needed to maintain and improve 
the viability of marine ecosystems on which we all depend. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I'm using a photo that Hillary took that exemplifies the harmony between marine birds, marine mammals in our oceans. So, and I celebrate this photo often. So thank you once again, Hillary. And thank you um, for, uh, for listening. Wow, thank you, Dr. Carl. That was very interesting. And thank you for highlighting the, the need of an integrated management and that we cannot just simply protect one species. We need to protect the whole global ecosystem. So just to repeat what I said previously, we will do Q&A after our next speaker. So please continue to add your questions into the queue and we will address them why after our next talk. So our third speaker for today is Dr. Boris Worm, who is a marine ecologist, professor at Dalhousie University at Halifax, Canada. His research program focuses on changes to marine biodiversity and the effects of fisheries, climate change, and other human impacts on global ocean ecosystem. He, he is also known as the CBC Radio's Ocean Guy and is the first person to be inducted into Ocean Frontier Institute's um, Ocean Literacy Ambassador Program. So without further ado, Dr. Boris, you have the floor. Hi, Lisa, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit from the two previous speakers whose talks I really enjoyed, focusing particular species groups and talking more, uh, maybe at a, a more abstract level, about conservation planning more generally and focusing very much on how we can account for the effects of climate change. Um, Lisa, can you guys see my, my screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So um, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about what I call climate smart conservation and spatial management. Um, this picture was taken at the 2019 climate march, which was, I think, a very important event for, for many Canadians who participated and really raised our awareness that uh, climate change is not just a future kind of concern. It's something that affects us right here, right now. And we need to really shift gear in terms of mitigation, but also adaptation and planning uh, to account for the fact that the world we live in is, is not the same that we were born into, neither will it be in the future. Um, now, many management uh, measures uh, are by their very nature quite static. So if you take fisheries management, for example, oftentimes we set um, fixed reference points such as maximum sustainable yield that's based on the historical productivity of the stock. If that productivity changes due to climate change, there's often not an easy way to account for it. Um, similarly, marine protected areas are fixed in space and time. They're there with fixed boundaries and they're there for all time. They're not really supposed to move, for example, with the effects of climate change. That makes a lot of sense in places like the Gully, which have um, a, a static geological feature, an underwater canyon that will be there for thousands of years. Um, but it not necessarily makes sense for species we're trying to protect that might be moving with climate change. And here in our region, we're seeing climate change progress uh, quite rapidly and species um, changing with it quite rapidly. And then marine spatial, spatial planning that tries to overlay different uses and find out how to reconcile them also often uses static layers um, that reflect the status quo, what's happening now, but not necessarily how it will look like in the future. At the same time, um, what's not static is that the extent of our protected area networks is, is, is increasing exponentially. This actually started in the 1960s and it has been increasing at a fairly constant rate of about 8% increase per year, which is more than uh, many other um, human or economic activities. Um, and of course, the target that's being discussed now and that Canada has already adopted along with some other countries is to raise this again quite dramatically to 30% coverage by 2030. So here's the numbers for Canada. Um, again, a, a very large increase in protected area coverage just over the last five years um, as um, a result of shifting government priorities. And again, a commitment to uh, at least double this um, 
up to 2030, so over the next nine years. So this is a real opportunity to um, do more for, for nature, but also maybe to do it in a slightly different way that accounts for the effects of climate change and uses marine protected area, and not just as a nature conservation, but also as a climate change adaptation and potentially even as a mitigation tool in places where we protect um, species or ecosystems that um, consume a lot of carbon and lock it away in sediments or where there's large sediment stocks, for example, that should not be disturbed by human activities. But it, I think it's a really big question in marine protected area um, science and planning. And the same is true on land, although I feel on land people have thought about this a little longer than in the sea, that how do we deal with things like the Great Barrier Reef bleaching and that climate change, although it's one of the best protected reefs in the world. How we do, do we deal with sudden fish kills or invertebrate kills like we see um, where oxygen levels are dropping in, in warming waters, particularly in shallow bays and inlets? How do we deal with extreme events such as hurricanes? How do we deal with um, certain species profiting from the effects of climate change and causing um, uh, sudden shifts in ecosystem configuration. None of this is really um, traditionally part and parcel of protected area planning. Um, oftentimes management needs to, respond to the, respond to this, but how can we plan for this? So this is where the Ocean Frontier Institute comes in, of which I'm part. It's a, you can think of it almost like a research accelerator based in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, but also at Memorial University in Newfoundland at the University of Prince Edward Island. So it's an Atlantic Canadian research initiative that really focuses on um, changes in the ocean, um, both from a physical point of view, um, changes in atmosphere ocean interactions, but also from an ecosystem point of view and even um, to some extent a human point of view. So how does our use of the ocean change with climate change and shifting ecosystems and what are some of the solutions we have to account for that? So I'm co-leading an interdisciplinary model, module on climate smart spatial planning uh, under the OFI and our objective is to make spatial planning and protected area management responsive to the challenges posed by rapid environmental change and shifting ecosystem configuration. So how can we anticipate this? How can we plan for it? How can we respond and make our protected area networks more robust to these um, changes and in some cases shocks? What we determined is what we need for this is we need to assess climate risk um, at, 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 as, as well as, as possible using all the available data and models. We need to um, produce spatial planning and management tools that allow us to account for climate change. And we need uh, legal and governance tools that help us to implement whatever measures we think um, might be needed. Um, it can't be done just in, a, in an academic bubble. It actually needs to be um, implemented in the real world. And for example, it's a good idea for some to make marine protected areas dynamic so they can shift over time. But there's no provision for this in the law and there's very little appetite for um, making uh, protected areas all of a sudden um, moving around. So maybe other tools are needed. But whatever the tools are, the ultimate goal is to build climate resilience in our marine spatial management and that includes um, protected areas. So I just want to give you a few research highlights from our work, uh, just to give you a flavor of, on what kind of things we're thinking about. Uh, we're doing this in collaboration with partners at uh, DFO, but also various non-governmental organizations such as Oceana, for example, or Oceans North. And we're looking, um, among other things, at um, how much uh, MPAs are exposed to climate change and um, and what are the consequences for management. So here you see a plot of um, all the protected area, marine protected areas we have right now, not just in Canada, but around the world. On the X axis, you see the time of SST emergence. So this is a year and it denotes the year where the climate envelope in that uh, protected area based on multiple climate models overlaid an average will depart from historical variability. So in other words, um, the coldest year in that protected area in that year will be warmer than the warmest years now. It's completely outside of the variability it experiences now. 
and sometimes this is also called a low analog climate, something that this, this place has not experienced in um, recent uh, centuries and millennia. So something completely novel. And what we're finding is that um, over the next 20 years, um, over half of our global NPA network will experience this shift. Um, so that's a short time frame, 20 years, not very long. And um, half is a large proportion. Um, and then possibly even more concerning, 95% of those that will shift to this no analog climate over the next 20 years um, are not very well adapted to historic temperature variability. They were in a fairly narrow temperature envelope um, over the last um, uh, decades and hundreds of years. And, um, and, and so they haven't really experienced large changes, large variability. So the species there are probably adapted to a relatively narrow temperature range. Although we can't show this, it's a, it's a pretty well-founded assumption. So that means um, maybe in protected area planning, we need to protect some of the areas that are changing very rapidly to give them all the chance they can get to evolve, um, but also maybe protect some refugia that are not changing to make sure we lock those in, protect some areas that will be suitable habitat in the future, although they might not be now, or protect them areas that are just turning over. So what we're thinking is that we need to spread our efforts more so over these four quadrants of um, fast and slow changing areas and high and low variability areas. When we feed information like this into uh, spatial planning um, models, um, this is typically done through algorithms that pick the most efficient and effective solution in terms of protecting the least amount of places for the largest amount of gain. And traditionally, a lot of this has been done um, with the objective to maximize the gain for biodiversity. That's the main reason we protect areas in the ocean. And um, that, for example, here in Canada, that's the main planning um, objective. But what we did in this recent paper, we just published last month, is to overlay this with other layers and see whether we can find areas where we have core benefits, not just for biodiversity, but also for fisheries rebuilding by protecting areas that have been previously depleted and that could recover within the protected area and then spill over into adjacent fished areas and areas that are very rich in carbon um, in the sediments that need to be um, safeguarded from um, say bottom contact gear such as trawling, ocean mining and other activities that could disturb that carbon. We found that ocean trawling has a very large carbon footprint um, by disturbing carbon rich sediments and that um, uh, marine protected areas could really help mitigate this, this risk to our climate system. So when you overlay these three objectives, you get a really interesting global map. Um, warm colors mean high priority. You see most warm colors are in coastal areas, although not exclusively so. And you see that they are situated in in uh, almost all countries, including Canada. They're not just in the tropics, they're everywhere. So um, we really think that this multi-objective planning, um, including um, carbon and climate change as a consideration um, is the way for the future. And then just a brief um, comment on legal and governance tools, also just uh, published a couple months ago an analysis of our response to the right whale uh, mortality crisis in the Gulf of St. Lawrence that we've heard about, and um, what are some of the legal and governance tools that have been used, um, such as, uh, for example, um, small scale rapid uh, closures that are revolving around areas where the whales are found right now, for example, by the acoustic monitoring that was talked about, um, but also by other tools. and. Um, being able to respond very dynamically to changing distributions and then adjusting human use patterns according to these distributions. Um, so what we found is that there's really not a good um, setup for these governance tools. Um, people are using whatever is available and maybe something in the Species at Risk Act, possibly also in the Fisheries Act and the Oceans Act has to um, change to adjust for that. We also um, 
collaborated with many others to hold um, UNEP hosted workshops. Um, UNEP is the United Nations Environment Program, now just called U UN Environment, uh, at the World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge, UK, um, bringing practitioners together with um, data scientists, with uh, mean protected area specialists to um, try to come to some consensus on how climate smart moving protected area management may look like in the future. We published a couple of papers on this um, that I'm happy to send to anyone um, who's interested. Uh, just send me an email and I share them with you. And we came up with a few policy recommendations and this is what I would like to close my presentation with. Just uh, some ideas on how the global conservation community, including IUCN, um, could shift to really account uh, for climate change in their um, in their policies. So the first recommendation was to create simply a catalog of uh, protected areas and whether climate change uh, adaptation has been accounted for in their management. Um, then the point I made earlier to create networks of MPAs and other effective conservation measures that span the range of past and future climate space. So to not just protect the future, to not just protect fast changing areas, but a bit of both to ensure that climate adaptation objectives are explicitly included in all MPA management plans, something we did a review on this and found that this is quite rare, uh, surprisingly, it's almost never mentioned. So that could change. Um, then design a global MPA network around fully protected management measures that are fixed, like the gully, for example, or the musquash, or really any of the protected areas we heard about today and supplement them by dynamic climate responsive tools such as the rotating closures in the Gulf of St. Lawrence to protect the right whale. We suggested to develop a specific target um, for the post 2020 biodiversity framework that um, accounts for climate change adaptations, provide policy incentives to actually do something about it and the necessary legislative tools to enable countries to enact these measures. And then um, last but not least, um, to center this around principles of stakeholder inclusiveness and capacity transfer. The background picture here is a planning exercise in the Bird's Head Seascape in Rajampat, West Papua, Indonesia. And this is what climate re resilience looks like there. I was just there a year and a half ago, 10 years after I first visited, and I was unbelievably impressed by the recovery of uh, large fish, sharks, turtles, and so on, but also of the reef itself in the face of climate change due to very careful planning and conservation measures. And Rajampat is actually one of the only six places we found in the world where these measures have been implemented quite comprehensively from the start. And so this is what it looks like. And it I was really um, very, made me very hopeful that something can be done um, even in coral reefs, which are really at the forefront of, of the climate change um, discussion. But also, and this is my other hat I'm wearing um, as an ocean educator and ocean literacy advocate, um, I think climate resilience looks like this where kids and others, um, but I care especially about kids, um, really uh, dive deep into uh, ocean content as part of their curriculum. We created a resource called Ocean School, it's at oceanschool.ca. It's free to use for anyone in the world to um, really bring these issues into the classroom or into their own education. And um, as a really engaging resources, virtual and augmented reality and others um, that help uh, people really um, get into the ocean space and, and feel at home there. So just to sum up, um, I think I made a point that climate change necessitates less static and more adaptive management approaches. We need new assessment management and governance tools. Um, this is only beginning now. And we need really quite a mind shift, um, both scientifically and socially, um, to build adaptive potential resilience and be prepared for what's, uh, what's coming next. So I want to thank everyone. Here's my email if you want to get in touch. Uh, and I welcome any comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boris, for a fantastic presentation and for emphasizing the need of education and innovative techniques to both address um, ocean conservation and to work bottom up to, uh, 
to teach kids to live more sustainably and consider ocean conservation as they are growing up. So now we will move on to our Q&A section. So please keep the questions coming in. I have a question here for Dr. Hillary um, on whales. So is identifying the presence of whales enough for closing fishing and protecting them, or does this only apply to at risk species? So currently off the east coast of Canada, the real-time measures, those dynamic measures um, that I mentioned, and Boris mentioned them as well, like um, fisheries closures or vessel slowdowns, only apply to sightings of North Atlantic right whales in particular areas off of Eastern Canada that we know can be problematic. Um, so currently, yeah, they are just relevant to North Atlantic right whales where there was um, that unusual mortality event and mortality of uh, too many right whales in the area. Well, thank you for, for that answer. And I know the dynamic management, it happens very fast, right? So like if they observe a white whale that day, then it's closed right away. Uh, it, it does take a little bit of a lag time um, to implement the, the management action. So it's not instantaneous, um, but within a couple of days of sightings, that's, that's when those management actions actually happen. Um, so it's really interesting, those detections. So when a plane goes out and sees a right whale or an acoustic detection comes in um, within uh, within less than a day, uh, the the managers within fisheries and oceans typically have access to those sightings, have made their management decision and about decisions about the actions that need to be taken, and then those are implemented over relatively short time scale. Um, so within a couple of days. Wow, very cool. Thank you, Dr. Hillary. So I have a question for Bowen that is for all of the speaker. What is the best way of communicating marine conservation to the broader audience and get them engaged? In my view, the best way is always what you are most comfortable with. So um, people have, have different skills. Some people like public speaking, some people like to work with kids, others like to write and to, um, uh, for example, write blog posts or letters to the editor. Um, I tend to think the more people you can reach or the deeper the engagement is the better. Um, so that could mean you're um, like one of my students, for example, who works on right whales is right now actually um, at an event with uh, high school kids, um, getting them on board with whale conservation and um, answering their questions. And um, she's not reaching a whole lot of people, maybe 20 of them or so, but the engagement could be really deep and, and, and um, last for a long time if they stay engaged. Um, and then other, the, at the other end of the spectrum, um, one of my students wrote um, frequent letters to the editor at the Globe and Mail about environmental issues, just making his voice heard and was published multiple times um, in, in the newspaper and got lots of feedback for it. Um, I think something we can all do is talk to our representatives. Um, so our members of parliament or members of the legislature or whatever it is in your country. Um, um, they're, they're there for us, they want to hear from us, and um, we should have a voice um, to them. But not everybody is comfortable doing that. So I think the best way to engage is the way you are comfortable with. You have to find your own voice, um, but then also make the voice heard to the audiences you most care about. Thank you, Dr. Boris. Um, Dr. Hillary and Dr. Caro, do you have anything to add? I think the only thing I would add is that uh, I think it's important to get people excited about the things we're trying to protect. And so being able to, you know, show them what it's like um, out there or, you know, pictures, videos, sounds, um, things that really capture their attention and make them sort of stop and think and, and want to learn more and uh, help them to care more uh, about these environments and the animals that are in there are also important. Yeah, for sure. Whales are considered charismatic species, so they are ways to 
inspire emotions and yeah, encourage people to take action. So I actually have a question for both Dr. Hillary and Dr. Carl. Um, both of the species that you protect, so the whales and the seabirds, they move around. Uh, and the boundary is for those animals, they do not fall under our political or our management boundary. Um, in that, you know, example, like how do you protect animals that doesn't just fall under a single country's uh, jurisdiction? Well, did you want to <laughs> take a shot at that or do you want me to start? I think Carl just got disconnected. I just got him. Yeah, there he is. Um, yeah. Yeah, forgive me. Go ahead, Hillary. Um, but I, I would like to comment on the previous question, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Okay. Um, so in, in terms of protecting species across international boundaries, it, it takes uh, a lot of collaboration. So, I mean, that is something we have to do in the whale world, um, and especially with North Atlantic right whales, because they are transboundary. And um, I, I work very actively with collaborators uh, in the US and DFO has built strong relationships with our, um, our partners in NOAA to try to develop mitigation measures and management strategies to help protect the species, not just in one of our countries, but throughout its range. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of communication and meetings and understanding what everyone is doing and how we can help each other out as well. So forgive me there, my, uh, I, my Zoom connection failed me, so I had to reconnect. Um, but if, if you could uh, repeat the, the previous question, I think it had to do with, with how to engage people. Well, this is an area where we've learned quite a bit from our work in terrestrial environments. Um, and, you know, the conservation community globally has, has learned tremendously from experience that, that in some instances, especially where uh, communities are involved, where, where people are close to the areas in question, um, early engagement, broad engagement is, is vital. Um, so here, what I'm referring to are, are integrated ground up approaches um, where uh, very early on an area can be scoped, um, values can be shared, uh, multiple perspectives can be voiced, um, and then a path forward can proceed from there. And that path forward can lead to the identification of strategies. In my presentation, I talked about the suite of strategies that are needed beyond protected areas. Protected areas will not get us out of this hole. We need a broad suite of strategies and figuring out exactly where each individual um, group or government department comes in, in terms of having the best strategy for the task. That's, that's a discussion that can happen within these sorts of integrated uh, framework. So there are uh, numerous uh, community-based initiatives throughout this country and beyond that serve to convene these sorts of conversation and, and help overcome, you know, ultimately some of the challenges that are faced if we choose to simply come down with a great idea of a protected area for here because it's so good. You know, we, we've, we've, we've encountered problems with, with those approaches um, internationally. And, and so there's a lot to be learned there. There's opportunity there. Um, in terms of a trans boundary, my, you know, my colleague, uh, Karina Jurgram and I um, uh, were involved in a project uh, uh, trying to address conservation of one of our uh, species at risk. It's one of these trans equatorial migrants, the pink footed shearwater that occurs off the Pacific coast. Its only nesting areas are off the coast of Chile. So we worked with WWF Chile to work with another group called Oikonos Chile, which also has a, a broader uh, a geographic uh, global scope 
to explore the implementation of, uh, of a ground up integrated process in Chile for the communities on the islands where this species nests, where it faces the greatest threats, and in the adjacent waters where it, fo where it faces uh, a, a further suite of, of pressures. And so those sorts of those sorts of conversations happening across the equator are essential to protecting the species that we identify as being ours, but clearly they're not ours. They belong to the earth. They belong to our ocean. And, uh, and we need to, to have you know, this breadth of conversation, of, of conversation to ensure the, the, the viability of these, of these species and species just like the pink-footed shearwater. Thank you, Dr. Carl. I agree that um, we will need an integrated effort and a global effort in addressing different uh, climate, not climate, marine conservation needs. As I alluded in my intro that we only have one ocean. We only have one solution or like one way of making a correct to protect our one global ocean. Um, so just moving on with actually a question I answered earlier is indigenous perspective. I just want um, our free speakers to comment on how we can actually integrate traditional and indigenous knowledge into our marine conservation planning because a lot of our natural sciences and a lot of our management effort right now is only based on Western knowledge. This is a this is a, a very important question and one that we I, I believe are all and endeavoring to to learn, um, and we within Environment Climate Change Canada and the CWS um, have have for example worked quite closely with Indigenous groups specifically in the north. I presented an example of Adige and a couple of, of examples of of collaboratively managed. Uh, protected areas in the north that were in fact identified by those local communities. We were sought out by those local communities to advance protections to ensure their access, their continued access to safe, healthy sources of food and sustenance. Um, but I really do appreciate your, your effort to present um, the, the need to, uh, to explore avenues like two-eyed seeing at Uapmunk. I think this is a very, very valuable perspective presented by Albert Marshall. And in, in some ways, um, we, are, we are working increasingly with low, at, at across scales with indigenous groups to navigate, to better navigate uh, conservation um, challenges. Um, and we're learning that, that sometimes the, the solution may not be actually integrating these perspectives, but respecting them and treating them as independent but complementary perspectives. Um, and, and, and so I, I, I don't pretend to have a solution. I think nobody has it, but I think as long as our intent is to learn and to continue open conversation and dialogue um, that will get us to a to a, a better place down down the road, and we're certainly committed to doing so. Yeah, I, I really like that perspective, Carol, um, and and I think we've all thought about this, uh, and it's done in different ways. Um, so in Indonesia, for example, the example I I noticed of Raja and Patbert's at Seascape, um, there was a, a almost separate planning exercises. One was done um, the the uh, the scientific, Western scientific way, and then there was also workshops, focus groups with um, indigenous groups, local groups, um, to come up with their priorities. And the really wonderful thing was, is they matched almost one to one. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Another one is is treating it as another data source that that's in in in, in another time dimension, because when we're sampling an ecosystem today, we're completely forgetting about what it used to look like, what it used to produce, um, which we cannot observe anymore, right? Because it's gone. 
but it's still in the knowledge and the um, uh, often traditional like handed down stories of indigenous people. So there's data there that may be incredibly informative because uh, we, we can't recreate that data. We have to rely on the people who were there at the time to observe. Um, so those are just two approaches, but I agree with Carol, the, the most important part I think is to, uh, to, to, to have open dialogue about um, different perspectives. And sometimes um, as Albert Marshall, Elder Marshall was saying, um, you see, when you look at both perspectives at the same time, you see stereoscopically. For example, you see back in time. You don't just see the present, you also see the past. So it gives a richer perspective. And I think that's what we're all aiming for. And there's not a whole lot I can add to this conversation because those are both such really great answers. Um, and I guess the only thing I can say is the, the open dialogue is so important and definitely something that uh, is really important within fisheries and oceans. Um, when we're talking about management of whales or marine protected areas or, or any of these other initiatives. If, if I could, you know, come back to that, I, I really do appreciate um, Boris's comments because we tend, and you know, I've fallen prey to this, I think many of us have, to see the world statically. Um, but really our programs, I, I, I speak of the Canadian Wildlife Service as, it's, as if it's been there forever. It's a very, very young program. Our data sets at best reach back 50 years. That's a very, very narrow picture. And I think we can learn tremendously about how we plan for the future by thinking and considering um, interpretations or depictions or, or, or the messaging that comes from a long history of presence on the landscape. Um, see, the, these are very important situ uh, uh, conversations that will, that will I, I, I believe, really enable us to navigate the challenges that we will face inevitably in the next 50 to 100 years. Well, thank you, our free speakers, for very insightful answers. Um, I have a different question. I think a lot of us on the call today are actually youth. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations on what youth can do to help with marine conservation. I think the most important thing is to have the right uh, frame of mind. And that means um, thinking positive about um, where we can go and imagining a future that's a lot better than what we have now. Not just uh, trying to preserve some status quo or trying to prevent harm, but actually envision a world um, that when you talk to youth, when you're older and more established, you can say it's better now than it was uh, before. To me, that's, the, that's a really important mind shift we have to, have to make. Um, we can't just uh, prevent harm. We need to act actively rebuild, and that includes protected areas and it includes um, endangered species management and includes be better fishery management, includes all of these things. And again, I would say people need to engage where they feel most comfortable and effective, things they really care about or they know or they have good connections to. Um, for a variety of reasons, that's where you need to engage. Um, nobody can do everything. And we are fortunately a global community of practitioners and, and conferences like this really make us feel that way, right? We're connected around the planet in trying to save this thing. And uh, we better work together and everybody needs to bring their best efforts and their best side, but nobody can do it all. And we all have specific um, aspects we, we care about, we're, we're, we're better um, in doing than others. And so we need to work where we're most effective. Um, so I think it's know thyself and then know where to insert yourself. I have to say, Boris, I love that answer so much. Um, and it's not what I've heard a lot of before. Um, so I, I think that's such a wonderful response to that. There are so many different things all of us can be doing and it can be overwhelming how much, like how many things 
need to be done. Um, but I just think it's such a great message to engage in where you're most comfortable and where you think you can be most effective. And I, I agree entirely. And it's and I see a network just like this one being a tremendously empowering way to 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 you know recognize that we're not alone in these pursuits. And yes, you know, I think we all have uh, complementary roles to play, and they can be quite a bit more varied than we could possibly imagine. Um, but I think this sort of network and, and, and learning from each other, learning from examples um, is, is, the, is, you know, a, an important key to, to future success. Um, and and not, not being constrained by the constraints of today and, and allowing yourself to imagine big, imagine, you know, a vision for the world that is not based on today's values and today's immediate needs or in structures. So, um, so yeah, so I echo the thoughts of both Boris and Hillary on that. Yeah, that was fantastic. I think all of us need to realize no matter what our ages or what our, no matter what our experiences, we can all do our part in contributing to ocean conservation. I recall there was a question that asked me at another workshop that perhaps you guys can comment on. It was that, you know, people here may be considering university or even grad school, but they don't, they don't necessarily come from a science background and they feel helpless in, you know, um, doing something for the planet or for anything conservation. I'm just wondering for all those um, people that are feeling lost because their educational background doesn't necessarily align with science, what can they do? Um, yeah. I think the problem is so much bigger than science and there's roles out there for everyone. So um, I think we're seeing more and more, you know, in meetings I go to and discussions we have about protection of whales, um, we see social sciences coming up more and more often and how do we effectively communicate to people and um, people with communications background and, and how do you reach out and get a broader audience and and so you don't necessarily need a science background to contribute I think it's important to be you know educate yourself and understand the issues um, but also there's all these other skill sets that you know some of us scientists aren't super great at. And so having people out there that are really good at that um, to help us would be terrific. Uh, so I think I think there is a role for so many um, different backgrounds and skill sets and not having the science background shouldn't limit you. I totally agree. And uh, also noting that most of the challenges we face today to, to affect change are not scientific challenges, they're political and societal challenges, right? So um, I think people who, well, not people who, we all can help with um, creating political momentum and societal awareness um, for the ocean and for what, what needs to be done to, to save it and save ourselves. And, but, but some people are even better at that because they have the background, they know how those processes work and, um, or they, they already work in say in government or they already work for an NGO that's good at affecting change. Um, or maybe that's an avenue they want to go down. And I agree, it, like scientists are just the first step in the supply chain, so to speak, from awareness, you know, seeing a problem for the first time to actually creating a solution. And there's a lot of people needed um, beyond the scientists. It's really just the first step. Um, but I, I also get the feeling that a lot of people see marine science as a, as a bubble, and it is to some extent, and, and we need to make that bubble more perme permeable so people can reach in from the outside and we can reach out from the inside and create those partnerships and conversations and relationships that help us to actualize our research. I think in government that's a little easier because they're kind of forced to reach out to other stakeholders. In academia we can be in a complete bubble and never talk to anyone and and I don't think that's acceptable anymore and it's 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 uh, it's too slow. 
So um, I think reaching in, reaching out from wherever you are, um, reaching across the table, maybe also talk to people you're not necessarily comfortable talking to in the first place. So that's not your friends, that's not the people who are already of the same mindset, but maybe others is often a good idea. Um, listening is a good idea, I feel. Um, listening to other perspectives, trying to understand where other people are coming from, because our worldview is always um, tunnel vision by our own, shaped by our own values, which are not necessarily values of other people. So all of that, and that's, that's, not, that's not marine science, that's other things, and we can all do it. Yeah, I, I also agree with, with, with that. It's, um, you know, from a science perspective, we've, we've become masters at, at the what. Um, we, we spend, we dedicate our entire careers to, to, to highlighting what, whether it be a species, a habitat, a process. Um, where we struggle is, is, is in the how. How, how we take what and translate that, move that into a how. So what are we going to do about it? And that's where we have a lot to learn from other sources of knowledge. And I, you know, what we are seeing in the, the terrestrial or, or, or typically landscape conservation world is, is we've learned tremendously from the international development community in approaches to navigating incredibly complex decision-making processes. We have to start learning from others that have, that similarly deal with these complex systems and very difficult decision-making processes and start to apply some of that learning to our conservation um, initiatives. And, and I think there's tremendous um, opportunity there to, to, to learn and to, to develop far more efficient and far and ultimately, hopefully more, more effective uh, conservation on the ground. Those are great answers um, from all our speakers. I think we can all learn from what you said that science is not necessarily the only solution to our environmental problems. Uh, we need to tackle the problem from many different avenues. So as um, we are reaching the end of our section, I'm just wondering from the audience if you have any other last minute questions. Or comments too would be helpful to just get your perspective. That's not necessarily only questions. Nicole, Hello. You, yep, we can hear you, Nicole. Can you hear me? I am Nicole King. I am a French environmentalist and an artist. I paint activist uh, paintings about the ocean and the ocean ecology. And I think that it's very important for the future to include the beauty of all these creatures that live in the sea. And that's what I'm trying to do in my painting. And I'm going to be exhibiting in Marseille, how hopefully if the Congress takes place, 35 activist paintings, uh, mainly about the sea environment and about the impacts of man, pollution and oil production on the sea. And I think it's uh, a good idea to include um, art and ecology together for education. And this is what I do. I opened a, a local art school called uh, Eco Ecole de Nicole. And it's, uh, we're using only recycled objects to make marine species uh, as piece of, pieces of art, if you understand what I mean. And this is very successful because the beauty of the creatures are put into um, value for the children. So it's just my personal experience. As a scientist now, I have changed into an artist, but I try to put the two together just as a witness I wanted to tell you. Wow, that's fantastic. I look forward to seeing it in myself if uh, yeah, the conference <laughs> happens in person. 
Any other comments or questions? Yeah, just just to uh, also uh, echo what Lisa said, and I I think uh, it's it the arts is another perspective, another hey. layer of awareness that we need to add to scientific understanding and 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 other values we may have um, about the marine environment. And it's it what what touches people, right? This is why people reacted so strongly to Blue Planet and and other documentaries like it. It's 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 less about the data; it's more about the beauty and the wonder and the and the mystery of the ocean. And I think uh, we cannot forget that. That's really important. Um, I also wrote a paper recently about ocean literacy and how we need to include other perspectives like the arts. And again, I'm really happy to send it to anyone who who, who sends me an email. Um, and that actually came out of a youth workshop as well um, with people from all around the world. So um, absolutely agreed. And thanks for that comment. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, uh, my colleague, Berenge, do you have a few last words for us? Can yes. Uh, yeah, I, I can see our screen. Um, so let's conclude this talk by uh, discussing what each of you can individually do. Uh, even if you live closer to the oceans or far, far away, there are ways that you can you can contribute to protecting the oceans and being more sustainable. Uh, firstly, it is educating yourself. Uh, try to read, try to see, try to talk to people who are working on the ground and try to get an overall perspective of what is happening in the world as well as uh, in your local regions. You can try to eat local, uh, so locally caught sustainable seafood or just like locally sourced um, seafood uh, with very less um, carbon footprint. You can say no to plastic and use reusable um, straws. Straws are quite generic, but also reusable containers, water bottles, and a lot of other stuff like that, cutlery. Um, you can just take nature walks, uh, try to explore the areas around you and try to connect with it uh, and familiarize yourself with the species around you and, um, and what sort of issues the, the regions face. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities like Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, they give out different grants. So even if you live far, far away from the oceans, like uh, Lisa and I, we worked on developing an app uh, to track the ghost gear in Atlantic Canada. So there are tons of opportunities, regardless of you living close to the ocean or not, you can try to develop tools and techniques and educate yourself. Uh, there is Global Youth Biodiversity Network, which gives out information and training materials and talks uh, like this one. There is International Ocean Institute, which does a lot of um, uh, capacity building, uh, conversations of policy and just like training on oceans and ocean related issues. There are a lot of tools. Um, a couple of them we'd like to mention here is um, Marine Debris Tracker. So whenever you are out on your nature walks and whenever uh, you can like pick out the debris uh, or plastic or any other waste that you find on your way, and you can also take a picture of that and report it on Marine Debris Tracker so as to form like, so as to contribute to a global platform that tracks all the trash around the planet. You can also use apps like eOcean. So whenever you are out on the oceans and you see different species, or if you want to report certain issues in certain areas, you can um, use apps like eOceans. And then there's Global Ghost Gear Initiative. Um, so if you're living close to the coast or if you're out in the ocean and if you see um, abandoned, lost or discarded ocean gear, uh, you can just take a picture of it. You can input basic information like where you saw it, if, if there's a, um, a marine species entangled in it and submit it on Global Ghost, Initiative, uh, Ghost Gear Initiatives app. Um, so they can connect uh, the people who will pick it out uh, in and around your area. 
Uh, these are just a few uh, things that you can do. And also I remember Dr. Worm shared uh, oceanschool.ca. So if you want to check that initiative out as well, it would be awesome. Yeah, to conclude, we just have one last poll. So what is your biggest takeaway from this workshop? You can go back to the link we were using earlier. Inspiration, yes, um, from everyone's talk, I definitely feel a lot more inspired. integration we need integration across sectors across country across um, different industries to definitely make a change and yes youth as youth here we have a lot of power to inspire change and encourage um, action of our decision makers and yeah our future generations Dynamic management is very, very important, especially with climate change and changing, changing um, ecosystem. And yeah, we do need to incorporate dynamic management on many different levels. And action, yes, everyone can do things locally and act locally, and it can have a great impact on our marine ecosystem. Yeah, those are all very great words, policy, individual. We need individuals to act. We need governments to create policies and yes. Wow, I see motivation as a, a very big word. I'm glad that people felt motivated and inspired from this workshop. But yeah, as we reach the end of our section, I just want to share with you a few links to get in touch with the Canadian Youth Biodiversity Network. We do have an Instagram, a Facebook, and a website, and our email is listed on the slide. Um, so if you have any questions on the workshop, feel free to drop us a message on any of this platform. And if they are for our guest speakers, um, we will be more than happy to pass the question on to them. I would like to thank everyone for attending today, especially our guest speakers for taking time out of their very busy life to join us today. And I would like to thank my Simon team to work with me this past month on organizing this conference. I would also like to thank the IUCN organization team for making the summit happened and to coordinate so many different op um, op opportunities. And I finally, I would like to thank our mentor, Lynn from IUCN for sitting down with us and going over our presentation multiple times. Thank you for joining everyone. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Go save the world. <laughs> Thank you, Boris. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.